Order. Order. Owen Thompson. Owen Thompson to move the motion. I beg to move that this House has considered the role of media in encouraging electoral participation. In consideration today, the role of media in encouraging electoral participation, I think, is very timely. With the EU referendum only a number of weeks away, as well as the Scottish Parliament, Welsh Assembly, Northern Irish Assembly and local elections in other parts of the UK only a one week away. So it really has become a focus. I'll be addressing my own particular opinion on how media can and should be involved in electoral participation. It continues to be a topic of interest of mine, uh, certainly that developed through the Scottish independence referendum, where it had so much impact uh, and it became an influence as part of my work as an MP and now as co-chair of the all-party group in democratic participation. I intend to talk today about matters such as electoral turnout and how this can be varied between groups in society and the role that the media has had in the Scottish independence referendum, its subsequent impact on voter turnout, changes in demand and how media needs to reflect this, what support politicians can give to an evolving audience on me how media of all platforms has a responsibility to its audiences. With the general election now almost a year ago, where we saw an overall increase in electoral turnout, it seems the right time to pause and reflect on the many different factors that influence this rise and the role that the media undoubtedly played in this and how we can best support these efforts going forward. Since 1950, when electoral turnout was 83.9% across the UK, there's been a steady decline in voter turnout, ending with a staggeringly disappointing low of turnout in 2001, where it reached just 59.4% across the UK. Although there has been uh, at beginnings of a, a rise again, it's not rising equally across all sectors of society or indeed across all parts of the UK. While I'm sure there was a variety of reasons for the increased turnout in 2015, there's also been an increase in media engagement of the electorate and a platform shift in the types of media that not only reaches out to engage and influence, but also platforms that people look to seek their information from. For many people present here today at this debate may expect me to use this to have a pop at biased media during the Scottish independence debate. I do have bigger points to make than to shame the BBC, Daily Record or the Daily Mail. The media and how this influences the electorate is no longer just a traditional party political broadcast or biased newspapers. It's not just the leaders' debates in the telly, although they are an important part. The media has evolved and begun to recognise the place it can play, not just in voter registration and turnout, but also in overall engagement. As people have become more politically aware, there's a far higher demand, and I believe broadcasters realise this and do want to meet the expectations of their audiences. Engagement in politics can be a difficult factor to me measure, and even more complicated is how and why people are influenced and how the media can contribute to this. Recent findings in the Audit of Political Engagement, the 13th study in 2016, concluded that the public's perceived levels of knowledge and interest in politics has reached, respectively, the highest and second highest levels in recorded history of the audit tracker. However, this is not the case across the whole UK, with notable variances regionally in, in relation to class and ethnicity. The audit also found that in terms of interest and knowledge, those ranked themselves with the lowest indicators were those from BME adults, women, and those from lower social economic backgrounds and non-homeowners. In Scotland, we've seen an unprecedented level of electoral participation, with the percentage of people that claim they are interested in politics, either very or fairly interested, standing at 74% compared to just 57% in the general UK population overall. That tend has to continue to grow after the referendum. I think there are so many lessons that we can learn from the experience of the Scottish referendum where people took to the issues themselves and it was peer-to-peer -peer information exchange far more than interaction with traditional media. Some media outlets caught up with this, some embraced it and that's seen uh, uh, this 
real enthusiasm for politics that we've not seen a lot of the in other parts of the country. And I think it, it's genuinely a good thing, and it shows that if you can get genuine engagement by the people, there is an interest in politics in this. Oh, well, it's only the politicians. The, they don't really count mentality. Actually, you can get beyond that. I thank my honourable friend for giving way and congratulate him on securing this debate. Does he agree that the engagement inspired by the referendum in Scotland in particular has continued up to the present day? And that's something I think we as SNP members are very much aware of as constituents continue to interact with us uh, through social media, even while we're taking part in debates uh, in, in the House of Commons. And Thompson. I do absolutely agree with my honourable friend. I think it's certainly something that we've all had to adapt to because... The, the expectation of availability, accessibility, uh, and the opportunity to have an interaction and a change of ideas uh, with us uh, is certainly still there. Um, and it's a, it puts a, a great responsibility on that, but I think that's a responsibility that all politicians really should be looking to, to live up to, because after all, we are the representatives of the people in this place. In terms of what it meant for voter turnout in general election in 2015, the turnout across the UK was 66.1%, a rise of 6.7%, which in the face of it actually is not too bad at all. On a regional level, voter turnout in England was 65.8%, 65.7% in Scotland, in Wales, sorry, 71.1% in Scotland, and 58.1% in Northern Ireland. However, if you exclude Scotland from the figure and you look at across a number of years, actually the turnout in elections really hasn't changed very much. When you exclude Scotland's turnout, the average turnout in England, Wales and Northern Ireland combined in 2001 was 62.9%, 62.2% in 2005, 62.6% in 2010 and 63.2% in 2015. So I think it, it, it does help to, to demonstrate this difference in engagement that we have seen in Scotland because of the referendum and, and this grassroots movement of people accessing their information in different ways and the ways that that's been taken forward. It's clear to many, and I expect many of my colleagues from Scotland will agree with me, we do need to learn the lessons from this and understand and encourage all types of media to engage with people politically. We must look to and support a host of platforms to enable this from the arts and social media to self-gathering grassroots media and so often a common factor in the Scottish independence referendum because we did see that it wasn't simply the traditional media, social media. The arts were getting involved in that debate. There were theatre productions on all sides of the argument and those on no, no side of the argument making the case that let people engage with politics in ways that were suitable to them individually and that actually meant that it created a far better level of engagement than they could ever have hoped for otherwise. It cannot be the case that people in the rest of the UK have any less desire to have a say in how their country is run or they do not understand how politics affect them. I campaigned in the referendum and spoke to people that did understand, but many had either lost trust in politicians or the political systems. In the referendum, these myths were blown out of the water Politicians were replaced by neighbours, family, friends and colleagues and trust in Scotland's politicians has begun to be regained, certainly in some parties at least. Yeah, yeah. So I actively encourage and celebrate campaigns such as those run by Bite the Ballot or Use Your Vote and Rock and Roll who have played a huge part in engaging and encouraging people to register to vote up and down the country. I'd particularly like to draw attention to campaigns designed to capture those who are disenfranchised and through targeted media campaigns like those run by National Union of Students or Gingerbread for Single Parents, Crisis and Shelter who give a political voice to homeless people. These campaigns give a voice to those who need to be engaged in politics the most. And I would also like to recognise the role of other forms of media such as recent efforts of TV programmes like Hollyoaks and Coronation Street and River City where they've shown politics as an everyday um, thing that people, real people in their, their communities and characters like in certainly Coronation Street and River City becoming councillors and being directly involved in the, the political process. And I mentioned the TV debates earlier. Only this week in Scotland we've seen a, a very new approach to the, the debates with a character from uh, Scotland's own Gary Tank Commander 
um, interviewing each of the party leaders um, in the run-up to the Scottish elections. This, in a way, has allowed uh, party leaders to present their messages in a forum that is so different to anything that I think any of them would have ever experienced before. But it also made it relevant and accessible to people who might have otherwise thought of they had no interest in politics, but suddenly, because it's a character they enjoy, they look at that, and from that point of view, and actually almost are watching politics accidentally, much in the way Gogglebox manages to pull this out. And uh, another example of a great uh, piece of innovation from Channel 4 that pushes uh, and manages to promote politics in a way that doesn't feel the traditional access into politics. Following the Scottish independence referendum, and the thirst for Scottish people to be engaged and participate in political decision making there's been a huge growth in peer-led grassroots media. Initiatives like the Common Wheel or Common Space have seen people from across the political spectrum unite in their desire to participate. This has been felt on a very local level in my own constituency uh, of Midlothian, with media platforms like Midlothian View and the Pennycook Cuckoo have become as much a source of information on what's happening as our own local newspaper, the Midlothian Advertiser. People are looking to access their information in different ways. Those media who are on the ball and keeping up with it are listening and are reacting. But I think there is a, a responsibility for, for us as politicians to encourage this and to promote it across all levels of the media. I am grateful to... In great, grateful to the Honourable Member. Uh, I think this is an important debate. Uh, in, uh, in my constituency of Woking, we have uh, two excellent local newspapers, the Surrey Advertiser, uh, branded the Woking Advertiser in Woking, uh, and the Woking News and Mail. Uh, and they cover uh, local politics, indeed national politics, uh, in, a, in a very considered uh, way. Uh, but I know that so many towns uh, are now without uh, a local newspaper, never mind two. Uh, and I just wonder whether maybe local radio stations should also be covering local politics and national politics more than they do to make up for the decline in that, un that very unfortunate decline uh, in our traditional local press. Owen Thompson? I would absolutely agree. I think it has, uh, it's a responsibility of all media platforms. It's in my own constituency with Black Diamond FM and Crystal FM, I'm very fortunate to have two community radio stations who do take an active interest in the politics locally and, and do their bit when it comes to elections, hosting hustings and such. So absolutely across all platforms. So whilst the media and social media platforms and broadcasters must participate, politicians also have a part to play in this need to rebuild trust with the constituencies and communities and listen to voters about who they want to be engaged. Social media platforms like Twitter and Facebook are helpful, but aren't enough. And after all, nobody, not everyone can be quite as popular as Nicola Sturgeon. Um, when we see huge swathes of the population disenfranchised because their vote never influences election outcomes, we should be worried. We've taken, when steps are taken to refuse votes at 16 as a demographic, they're more engaged we should be worried. As well as exploring how media engages with politics, also give consideration how the politics engages with people. I think reforms are certainly needed. And the key message I'd like the, the Minister uh, and those interested in this debate to take away is that we should be able to all be taking steps, every step we possibly can, and we should be engaging and encouraging all aspects of the media to be involved in politics. The very meaning of the word politics translates to of, for, or relating to the citizens. And it's highly time that we all paid attention to that. Here, Minister, John Penrose. Thank you, Mr. Crosby. Good to have you uh, looking after us this afternoon, making sure we all behave ourselves and, uh, and that we have a productive debate. And I would like to just add my congratulations to the Honourable Gentleman from, from Midlothian, um, who is, as he says, involved with the all-party parliamentary group in this area. They do incredibly important work, um, and it is something which I think we need to try and develop a better cross-party approach to, I, th I think particularly for things like voter registration. Um, we do better together than we do separately. I think political parties have a place, there is no doubt, in getting their, their um, normal demographic supporter base to get registered and get out and take part and use their vote on polling day. But there is something more than that on a cross-party basis, if we can cooperate on that basis, um, then that is, I think, 
more often reassuring to voters because they can see that it is being done from purer democratic motives rather than just for party advantage. And that can make a difference. So I think the all-party parliamentary group's work is in that um, proud tradition and therefore something which is, is hugely to be supported and applauded. Um, he also mentioned, Mr. Crosby, um, various surveys of democratic engagement, democratic involvement. And it's interesting that, uh, that the results he was quoting pretty closely match, directionally at least, um, with those you see if you start to compare levels of voter registration. Voter registration isn't a perfect proxy for democratic involvement because obviously you can be registered to vote and then not actually use your vote on polling day. But it's a, not a bad proxy and it's very interesting that he mentioned that some um, BME community groups are underrepresented, less likely to be registered. Others, incidentally, Mr. Crawlsby, are extremely well represented. There's some parts of the Asian community in this country um, whose registration rates are well above average. Um, but, as he rightly mentions, um, there are some which are below. Equally, we have problems with people who um, are uh, living in short-term rented accommodation, who have, perhaps move quite regularly. Um, there's some debate going on about whether or not the reason for them not registering is because they are disaffected and don't believe in the idea of democracy being relevant to them, or whether or not it's just inconvenient because the registration folk don't keep up with them as they move around. It may be a bit of both. There's some query um, behind that. Um, students can be a problem um, in terms of levels of registration, although, interestingly, there's a, a degree now of evidence to show that quite a lot of students are registered at their parental home address as opposed to at their uh, university address. So, Again, we need to be careful in the way that uh, that set of figures are taken. Um, and actually, the, the single worst registered group um, is one which we often forget about, Mr. Crosby, and that is expatriates. We currently have between one and a half and two million uh, Brits living abroad who are currently legally entitled to vote. They lose the, the right to vote at the moment after 15 years. We aim to change that in due course as well. But even as the law currently stands, there's perhaps one and a half, perhaps even more than that, estimates vary, up to two million perhaps, um, people living abroad who are currently legally enfranchised, um, and yet the level of registration amongst that group is, at the last general election, was only just over 100,000, so between five and 10 percent at the very, very highest. Um, and they are by far the least well-registered group, and they are therefore by far the least well-represented group um, amongst all the different uh, groups that we need to get involved and need to uh, bring into the fold, as, as, if I can put it that way. But the role of media, uh, as the Honourable Gentleman from Mid Logan says, is incredibly important. And I particularly like the fact that he was pointing out that the way social media has changed democratic debate um, is not only important for us as practising politicians, but I think it's also important for the overall body politic, for the state and the way... Um, our democratic consensus is forged and the way democratic debate takes place, because he's absolutely right. More of it now is peer-to-peer, -peer, I think was the phrase he was using. Um, in the past, Mr. Crosby, I, I venture to suggest that peer-to-peer -peer debate was basically what you said to your mates down the pub. Um, but the advent of social media means that now there are Facebook groups all over the place. Um, there are uh, Twitter streams all over the place. There are, dare I say it, even Snapchat groups of one kind or another. And what they mean is that people with very, very disparate interests, very, very disparate points of, points of view, um, can come together much more simply, much more easily, um, and share their points of view. And that is something which is both relevant for campaigning groups, people who uh, have a particular interest in anything from saving hedgehogs through to democracy in Burma and everything in between, the sorts of things which actually are frequently covered by all party parliamentary groups in this, in this building. Uh, but it allows them to organise nationally much more effectively and much faster than they ever used to do and much more cheaply than they ever used to do. But there is, of course, uh, 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 something which we need to take care of in that process, which is that if you are always surrounded by people um, either digitally online or uh, physically in the offline world, um, then you risk finding yourself purely in an echo chamber where everybody always agrees with you. And there is, I'm sure he would agree with me, nothing more dangerous for any politician than only to hear the opinions of people who always agree with you. And it leads you, leads you into some very, very dangerous waters, including believing that you're always right, um, and being, if you're not careful, uh, impatient with people who do then have the temerity to hold a different point of view. And, of course, 
part of the weft and warp of good democratic debate is that someone can disagree with you, and not only that, they may disagree with you honestly, fervently, strongly, and not be a bad person. They can nonetheless be an incredibly principled person, just you happen to hold different views. And one of the dangers that you can get with an echo chamber effect is that you end up with people becoming more likely to be short-tempered with each other um, if they hear competing views. Nonetheless, digital media and this, this uh, vastly extended scope of peer-to-peer -peer debate I think has been incredibly powerful, incredibly important to the way in which our um, democracy functions. Not just our democracy, but I think uh, every democracy too. He also mentioned the effect of broadcast media, and I think we should include here TV, national radio, local radio as well. Um, I must thank him for a start for introducing me to the concept of Gary Tank Commander. I'm afraid he doesn't normally make it quite as far down into the southwest as, as, as where I live down in Western Supermare. Um, but now I am resolved that I must go and find him because I'm told that he's um, a, a very funny and B has been doing some very interesting stuff um, as a comedian but interviewing politicians up in Scotland. An interesting crossover, not one which I think has been done very commonly, certainly in this country, much more widely. Or if it has been done, it's been done more in the lines of um, taking the mickey out of politi unsuspecting politicians, um, rather like Sasha Baron Cohen has done. Um, and this is a different sort of thing um, again. So it's potentially a very interesting thing. But... There are other areas which the broadcast media have historically done great things too. We all are aware, Mr. Crosby, of the... Order, order. The sitting is suspended for 15 minutes for a division in the House. So 21. Uh, order, order. The sitting is resumed. The debate may now continue until 16.54. Order. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Crosby. Uh, the temptation to, to restart by just saying Gary Tank Commander and is very, very strong, but I should try and uh, remind, remind everybody here. We just finished talking about, uh, about the effect of social media and the way it has changed our democratic discourse, mostly for the better, I think, but with some, with some caveats. I was moving on to talk about both broadcast media, national TV, radio, and local radio in particular, um, but also the arts, because the Honourable Gentleman from Midlothian um, was rightly taking pains to emphasise their contribution too. I think we're all familiar with, uh, with the national contribution of broadcasters when it comes to current affairs and news programmes. Um, but, of course, there are many other things, and, and the Honourable Gentleman mentioned, for example, soap operas. So we've had um, examples of um, voter registration and political involvement playing into the plot lines of Hollyoaks. Um, I believe also um, River City and various others too. So these are all occasions when... Uh, normal life as portrayed, albeit through drama, um, can be made to include what should be normal life as well, which is normal political involvement, be it by someone standing for the local council or getting involved in a campaign to save their local theatre or whatever it might be. But that makes it, it brings it home to people as being part of the normal way that the world works, what ordinary people do, what normal people do, and it means that it is, it reduces the distance between um, politics and people, because as, as the Honourable Gentleman rightly pointed out, the two should be synonymous, the, the, the roots of the word are the same. Um, and it also stops politicians being seen necessarily as a slightly weird class of other people um, who have different interests and different motivations from everybody else, and reminds us all that actually politicians should be the same as everybody else, we should be the same as our next door neighbours, we should live uh, in the same world as everybody else. And drama can do that in a very, very powerful way. Broadcast drama obviously has huge reach. Theatre can make a difference, but also other arts too. Um, the visual arts, for example, in my own constituency of Western Supermare, Mr. Crosby, uh, we recently paid host to a world-class, world-famous um, exhibition organised by the street artist Banksy um, in, a, in, in the Tropicana Lido on the, uh, on the seafront, uh, Mr. Crosby. And it was fascinating because quite a lot of the art which both Banksy produces but also some of the other artists that he was fe featuring produces had a political message. It was mainly the politics of protest, interestingly, but nonetheless it will have driven political involvement. And I was asked by a number of journalists, was I comfortable with these politics of protest, slightly in many cases left-wing um, uh, uh, political statements as part of the art in the middle of Western Supermare? And to which my unhesitating answer was yes, very, very happy indeed, if only because... If it makes people think, and one of, the, one of the things that art is supposed to do, of course, is to make people think, um, if it makes people think and makes them realise that these things affect all of us 
and not just politicians and this, this, uh, this class of other people, then I think it is all to the good. Comedians can do the same. We've mentioned Gary Tankerman, but actually political comedy and political satire has a very long um, and, re I was going to say, respectable history. Probably calling satire respectable is wrong. The one thing, Mr Crosby, which I think we as politicians need to be careful of, though, is that satire is partly, by its very nature, a distancing thing. It, 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 it creates the distance which we need to collapse as well. So um, some forms of comedy can add to the problem as well as subtract from it. So we, we need to acknowledge that there are that, that can be a double-edged sword as well. But, of course, um, we are. if I go back to the national media, to the national TV, national radio, and also local radio in particular, while we are all very comfort comfortable and familiar with things like news and current affairs programmes, and more recently, and I think this has been a huge um, adornment and improvement to our national political uh, discussions, Mr Crosby, I think we've had uh, the leaders' debates have made a great deal, deal of difference as well. While we are used to those, um, I think that there is this broader um, approach um, across into drama, across into other things other than current affairs, which broadcast media should be using. And then more broadly than that, uh, Mr. Crosby, there are other media, particularly media, for example, the materials that are used in schools. And now the Honourable Gentleman from Midlothian mentioned, for example, the rock and roll uh, campaign, the rock and roll materials. These are, these are um, schools materials used or produced in the Cabinet Office, Mr. Crosby, by people in my team, and then used very, very widely in schools right the way across the country in order to um, teach pupils about democratic engagement as part of a broader programme of citizenship. All of these materials, all these media, um, are incredibly important as a way of um, making democracy, again, part of what everyone is brought up with. Um, and if you are brought up with it and is explained to you when you are, um, even before voting age, and certainly when you've just achieved it, and it becomes part of your normal life in the same way as um, owning a tablet PC might be nowadays, or whatever it might be, or owning a phone, then it becomes part of your normal um, breathing of, of uh, a, 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 and the normal way you run your life, and that makes a huge difference as well, I believe. The final group, or well, the final two groups I'd like to just mention, Mr. Crosby, if I can, civil society groups can make a huge difference. They, many of them produce their own media, either written or, in many cases, um, online. Um, and many of them um, are very, very closely focused, tightly focused, deeply engaged with specific groups of voters, many of whom are in those hard-to-reach, under-registered groups that the Honourable Gentleman from, from Midlothian was talking about. So, for example, Operation Black Vote, and people like Bite the Ballot, all these others um, are uh, incredibly effective, or even if they aren't incredibly effective, they are more effective than anybody else, and therefore you know, leaders in their field um, at persuading people in those groups um, that it is worthwhile getting involved in a de democratic process. And, Mr. Crosby, as we were saying earlier on, part of the difficulty is that uh, we have some groups which are underrepresented or underregistered because it is just inconvenient, because, for example, if you move house frequently, uh, then the system may not keep up with you um, and make sure that your registration is moved from one house to the next if you move um, regularly and often. But there are also some groups where that inconvenience or democratic, uh, uh, bureaucratic <coughs> friction is not the whole story. And in some cases, there is a high degree of distrust of democracy, of the democratic process, of politics and of politicians, um, of all kinds, of all political persuasions. Um, and therefore, there is a, a question of all of us as politicians and these various different groups needing to develop a, a, more of a poetry of politics, a, a persuasion that politics is something which can be really uh, effective at improving their lives rather than something for other people as well. And finally, Mr. Crosby, I would just, we, no mention of media would be complete without, of course, mentioning um, the print media. And it was noticeable that the Honourable Gentleman from Midlothian um, barely touched on them at all. And I think that is because, partly because it is no secret that many, in many cases, while they are still immensely powerful and widely read, uh, many newspapers are suffering from declining circulations. Um, and while I think it would always be a huge mistake to write them off, um, they are certainly an industry which has broader problems, even though they still carry an enormous amount of weight and heft. And therefore, all the comments which we've been making about broadcast media um, with some you know, differences to do with the actual nature of the medium itself, I think also apply to the print media too. And therefore, Mr. I'm sorry, the In the one minute I have left, yes. Less than a minute, but go. Cool. Also, to say very briefly, 
uh, that the much maligned uh, council newspaper or magazine can also help. So in Woking, we have an excellent council newspaper, uh, and it always encourages registration, participation, and really explains in a, in a, in a grounded, uh, proper way uh, how the electoral process works and when the elections are. Oh, Mr. Crosby, I, I couldn't have put it better myself. And with that, I think I will, uh, I will leave those final words as a good way to finish off our debate, um, and we'll sit down. The question is that this House has considered the role of the media in encouraging electoral participation. As many of that opinion say, I, of the contrary, no, I think the eyes have it. The eyes.